you watching in the morning or in the afternoon, or some of you I know watch in the evening, we welcome you to uh, this service of worship. Um, you saw, I hope you took note on the uh, announcements that uh, our book and puzzle sale, which was a kind of a pass-through event, uh, went extremely well. Uh, the church um, was able to meet and greet a lot of community members as well as it's our own members and uh, a lot of people happily took home books and puzzles to be able to uh, keep them occupied as the colder weather comes as once the leaves are raked right what better thing to do than have a cup of tea and do a puzzle so that was wonderful it was a wonderful opportunity for us and um, there are thoughts and plans about the bazaar and how we can do that coming up and if you need to ask questions um, our contact is Robin, or you can always call the office. You can call the office and probably get Robin. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so either which way, uh, just give us a call if you've got some questions or ideas. And then I think you saw that we have board of managers on Tuesday, and then there's presbytery by Zoom on Wednesday, and our Bible study on Thursday, and our finance committee on Thursday. So I should just say... Goodbye to my husband, who's coming <laughs> week. See you next week. And with that, let us all join together in our responsive call to worship. The God of wisdom calls us to worship. In humility, we gather to offer our thanks and praise. The God of peace calls us to let go of our cares and worries. In faith, we turn to God for hope and guidance. The God of past, present, and future welcomes us into this moment. Enjoy we celebrate life in God's presence. Let us worship God together. Hallelujah. Let us praise the Lord. And let us pray. God of light, you meet us in the dim, frosty mornings when we can see our breath before us. You meet us under the noonday sun, which has lost its intensity. You meet us in the shortening of days, with curled and cracked leaves floating down, and earlier and earlier sunsets. Our world is transforming before our eyes, wrapping itself in the quilts of new winter, dusted with early morning frost. We thank you for this time of slowing down, of slumber and sleep, this time of change and rejuvenation that you have designed and you have called forth and you are overseeing. May we rest in the assurance that your magnificent presence is everywhere we look. God of justice and mercy, you call us to be a part of our community, loving our neighbors and saving, serving your purposes. We confess that this is easier said than done. Sometimes we leave good things unsaid. Sometimes we do not really listen with our hearts. Sometimes we walk by too quickly. We often sit in judgment on those who serve in public life, criticizing any who fall short of our expectations. Yet we confess we, too, fall short of your loving purpose for us. Forgive us when we have been too quick to criticize and too slow to join in what needs to be done. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It is written in Hebrews that our sins are remembered no more because Jesus opened a new way of life for us through his death and resurrection. Therefore, know that we are forgiven and forgive one another. Our first hymn this morning is one that most of us learned in our childhood. It's number 773, Jesus Bids Us Shine.
first reading this morning comes from the book of Hebrews. And uh, it's, this is, I, if you remember, we, we, we were reading earlier on in this, it's an essay. It's an essay that has been written, and it is about Jesus Christ. And they, uh, the, the author of this essay is comparing Jesus to the priests of old. And, and, and you know, priests would, would uh, do the sacrifices, make, uh, they perform the sacrifices, and then there, in the temple there was always that inner holy of holies room that was divided off by a curtain, and only the priest could go in there and, and, and have uh, more of a direct connection. But so the, he, the author of Hebrews is, is now writing this letter and trying to explain how things are different. And so it is about Jesus Christ, although sometimes he refers to him as this priest. He's talking about this new priest. Jesus takes the place of the priest. Day after day, every priest stands and performs his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. And since that time, he waits for his enemies to may be made his footstool. For by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy. The Holy Spirit also testifies to us about this. First, he says, this is the covenant I will make with them after that time, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and I will write them on their minds. Then he adds, their sins and lawless acts will I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Christ, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we possess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. pictures in it. If you do, you just sit right there in the middle. That's pretty good. Yeah. If I hold it like this, can you see? Can you get me? Okay. Now, I don't know if uh, the people on the camera noticed, because Trevor had to swing fairly quickly, but we have some beautiful birds on the screen, and you know I am an environmentalist, so I'm going to ask you a question. I hope this one's not too hard. Does anyone know what kind of bird that is? It is a type of crane. Do you know what kind of crane it is? And don't feel embarrassed. You're not going to see them in Canada. In fact, if you got to see one of these in your whole life, you count yourself blessed. So th this... The, this is a pair, and you can see they have bands on them. This is a pair of whooping cranes. And whooping cranes are endangered, so endangered, 
that there were at one point only 20 birds left. Now they have worked, that's why these guys have bands on them because they are being watched and studied and we're trying to save the species. Right now, I believe the last count is we're up to 80. So at least it's going in the right direction. Does anybody have any idea why the whooping crane is so endangered? Why do you think? Uh, I think some people try to kill them. That is, yes, that's the problem is that they're dying. And partly the reason they're dying, well, there's a couple reasons. First of all, can you guess how many eggs they lay in a nest? Um, it's not a big number. One? Well, she's right. They lay two eggs, but only one egg hatches. So each couple, every breeding season, only has one baby. So that's something there. They are not reproducing themselves. That's not the way they are. And then they need to travel. They migrate quite far in the United States and Mexico too. Actually Canada. From Canada. And as they migrate, the problem is, is the place, of course, they can't fly the whole way. They have to stop in very designated habitats where they can eat. And guess what's happening to those habitats? Katrina? They are. They're getting bulldozed. And so they can't make it. They don't have enough places. So one of the ways we are changing is they are now trying to actually make designated rest stations for the whooping crane so it can migrate, but they have to be mindful about protecting them. So with that little lesson, I want to read a book to you that was introduced to me this week called There is a Bird on Your Head. And this lovely book, though, shows a kind of an attitude which I think a lot of people have about a bird being in their space. And what we need to do is rethink about, it's about sharing, it's about sharing God's world. So Katrina, have you ever seen this book? Okay, it's a book written by Mo Willems. And I'm so glad you're here because I thought this was a very, very good, funny book. Now the first page has no words on it. It just has a bird coming down and there's these two friends, the elephant and the piggy, and they are having an afternoon nap. I will not ask you to put up your hand if you are one of the people who likes to have an afternoon nap, but these two guys do. <laughs> having a little nap and down comes the bird. You can see how you see the bird coming right down? Yeah, okay. And that obviously wakes one of them up. And the elephant says, piggy, Is something on my head? Yes. There is a bird on your head. There is a bird on my head. <laughs> Imagine a big elephant like that. It's just a little bird. Is there a bird on my head now? No. Did you see? Did you see? Yeah, you see. Yeah. Now there are two birds on your head. It doesn't look very happy, does it? No. What are two birds doing on my head? They are in love. <laughs> the birds on my head are in love. They are love birds. Love birds. How do you know they are love birds? Can you see? They were kissing. I know, <laughs> exactly. And now the next thing that's going to happen is they are making a nest. Two birds are making a nest on my head. Is it 
good one, isn't it? Yeah. I know. It's really funny. Why would two birds be making a nest on my head? I'm afraid to ask. Do I have an egg on my head? <laughs> He's going to lift Piggy up. See, he's lifting him up. One, two, three. You have three eggs on your head. I do not want three eggs on my head. Then I have good news. The eggs are gone. The eggs are hatching. Hatching? The eggs on my head are hatching? They have hatched. Look at Piggy's shedding a tear. He thinks that's so beautiful. He's kind of like crying because it's so beautiful. Now I have three chicks on my head and two birds and a nest. I do not want three chicks, two birds, and a nest on my head. Where do you want them then? Somewhere else. Why not ask them to go somewhere else then? Ask them? Ask them. Okay, I will try asking. Excuse me, birds, will you please go somewhere else? No problem. It worked. Bye. Now there are no birds on my head. Thank you, Piggy. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> See what happened? The nest just moved over to Piggy's head, right? <laughs> now, that is a cute book, but sometimes that book reminds me of the way we are. We don't want not on my property, not on my space, but if we don't make space, we're going to lose beautiful birds and beautiful animals just like the whooping crane. So I thought it was a good reminder to all of us to just think about what sharing means. So let's say a prayer before we continue. Gracious and creative God, thank you for letting us share this world with pigs and elephants and birds that are having, making nests and having chicks and whooping cranes. And we ask that the whooping crane continue to thrive and flourish as you would have every living thing on this earth thrive and flourish. And if that means that we need to take note, and we need to help, and we need to share our space, then put in our hearts a sharing heart, and one that cares for all of creation. We ask all of this, Lord, through your Son, who came and shared so much with us. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Katrina, you can go back and sit with your dad. Thank you. Would you like to look at the book? You can take it and look at it, and I'll get it later. Okay, our second reading this morning comes from 1 Samuel, and we are starting right at the very beginning of 1 Samuel. There is a certain man from Ramathane, 
a Zufite, from the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Elkanah, son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. He had two wives. One was called Hannah and the other Panina. Panina had children, but Hannah had none. Year after year, this man went up from his town to worship and sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh, where Hophni and Phinehas, the two sons of Eli, were priests of the Lord. Whenever the day came for Elkanah to sacrifice, he would give portions of the meat to his wife Penina and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, because he loved her and the Lord had closed her womb. Because the Lord had closed Hannah's womb, her rival kept provoking her in order to irritate her. This went on year after year. Whenever Hannah went up to the house of the Lord, her rival provoked her till she wept and would not eat. Her husband, Elkanah, would say to her, Hannah, why are you weeping? Why don't you eat? Why are you downhearted? Don't I mean more to you than ten sons? Once when they had finished eating and drinking in Shiloh, Hannah stood up. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his chair by the doorpost of the Lord's house. In her deep anguish, Hannah prayed to the Lord, weeping bitterly. And she made a vow, saying, Lord Almighty, if you will only look on your servant's misery, and remember me, and not forget your servant, but give her a son. Then I will give him to the Lord for all the days of his life, and no razor will ever be used on his head. As she kept on praying to the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying in her heart, and her lips were moving, but her voice was not heard. Eli thought she was drunk, and said to her, how long are you going to stay drunk? Put away your wine. Not so, my lord, Hannah replied. I am a woman who is deeply troubled. I have not been drinking wine or beer. I was pouring out my soul to the Lord. Do not take your servant for a wicked woman. I have been praying here out of my great anguish and grief. Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. She said, May your servant find favor in your eyes. Then she went her way and ate something, and her face was no longer downcast. Early the next morning they arose and worshipped before the Lord and then went back to their home at Ramah. Elkanah made love to his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. So in the course of time Hannah became pregnant and gave birth to a son. She named him Samuel, saying, because I asked the Lord for him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our next hymn is hymn 314, God is love, come heaven adore.
the meditations of our hearts be pleasing unto you, O Lord. Amen. I had to wait this week in line outside of Service Ontario. I got there at 4 p.m. and Service Ontario closes at 5 p.m. There were about 20 of us in line. And I'm not sure if it's just me or not, but it seems that we're doing a lot more waiting these days, especially in outdoor lineups. And even though we're getting a lot more practice at waiting outside of banks and medical testing labs and government buildings, I don't think our tolerance for waiting patiently is getting any better. In fact, I think it's getting worse. Out of 20 people waiting in line with me outside of Service Ontario last Tuesday, four of them left the line, which was good for me because I got to move up twice, thereby reducing my waiting time. But I did feel sorry for the young man behind me who was definitely willing to wait, but his grandfather insisted after 20 minutes that they get in the car and leave. Now, I know this young man was willing to wait because at 4.10, he asked me if I knew when Service Ontario closed. And upon hearing that it closed at 5, he kind of looked ahead, calculated, and declared, yep, Indeed, he felt sure he would make it inside before they locked up for the day. In fact, that was definitely one of the things we were all thinking as we were standing in line. Number one, do we have all the correct documentation or would we be sent right back out of there to get something we had forgotten to bring? Number two, how are we going to stay warm standing in the shadows of late afternoon November concrete? And number three, would we get to the door and to the inside wicket before they called for closing time or would all of our waiting be in vain? I did get in by the way. I got my Ontario health card and my driver's license I paid $90, and I drove home to warm up my frozen fingers and toes. However, I do wonder how the rest of the lineup behind me fared. I didn't stay to see. And while I was waiting, I was thinking about something new I had learned this week. And as a theologian, it probably doesn't get you guys excited, but it gets me excited when I learn something new about the Bible. And then I always want to tell somebody, and the first people I think of, I want to tell, pass it on to, is you, my congregation. So this is what it was. I learned that in the Christian canon, or the Bible, the book of Judges is followed by a tiny book, you can even check it out, the tiny book of Ruth. And then we go on to First and Second Samuel. And of course, 1st and 2nd Samuel, which we read from today, is essentially the history of God's man, King David, and how he came to rule Israel humanly, yet faithfully. But in the Hebrew Bible, in the Tanakh, or the Hebrew canon, the book of Ruth appears much later in the order, later in the writings. The Hebrews' arrangement gives a more historically fluid account of that significant time of transition for God's chosen people. This is the unlaundered history of how a group of people loosely organized in 12 scattered tribes was transformed into a centralized state which caused massive social change and a reconfiguration of power. We often forget to look at that full sweep of time and history contained in the Bible and therefore lose some of the context about which each story is being told. The Hebrew 
tribes were threatened and bullied by other nations, especially the Philistines. And they fell into some serious series of dismal failures. They suffered and they floundered. And as soon as the people cried out to God for help, God would raise up leaders called judges. And some of these judges were strong and faithful, like Deborah and Gideon. And others succumbed to human temptation and idol worship, like Jephthah and Samson. And the tribes were plunged into violence, bloodshed, and death, oftentimes enacted upon their own people. Brothers killing brothers and sisters. They were in deep trouble and they could not get themselves out of it. The last dismal line of the book of Judges reads like this. In those days Israel had no king and everyone did as they saw fit. That's the definition of chaos by the way. Take note, there's no mention here of God in this moment at this time. All of this history took a long time, years and years, decades of waiting, waiting and wondering if it was all in vain. And then, at the beginning of this new book, we have the unembarrassed telling of how God is playing a central part in their time of waiting and in their time of transition. God sometimes acts and speaks directly. Sometimes God governs in hidden ways. The question is, how will Israel wait while they are waiting for a king? And so the story of their lives was told like this. There once was a certain man named Elkanah, and he came from a long line of great men. He had a proud and distinguished past. This man, backed by great men of history, is matched with a barren and bereft woman with no possibility of a future. His wife Hannah is taunted and bullied by one who proudly produces a whole army of sons and daughters. We are told in a most straightforward fashion that the Lord has closed her womb. Hannah's waiting is confused, and Hannah's waiting is bitter. Hannah knows what it means to wait in vain. Hannah, why are you weeping? Why do you not eat? Why are you downhearted? And her husband used to say, don't I mean more to you than ten sons? But Hannah's barrenness even overrides the power of Elkanah's love. The priest Eli thinks she is drunk when, she, when he sees Hannah praying. And she is not drunk of course, she is desperate. She draws near to God and pours out her heart, her humiliation, her vulnerability, her fear that she will wait in vain until the doors of life are shut and locked and there will be no future for her. Eli gave her the customary blessing from a temple priest. Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And Hannah believes what Eli has said. Here is a moment of change in a million moments of change. But this moment recognizes God as actively, planfully present. How will Hannah wait? She will wait as Israel should wait, knowing that God's transformative power creates new possibilities where none existed before. 
God brings life where no future can be discerned. But waiting is hard. We get cold feet. We feel powerless. And we want to give up our place in line and leave. We worry that our waiting will be in vain. We get distracted. We can even get bitter. The essay to the Hebrews also addresses waiting, for they were, as we are, waiting in a time in between, in a time of already here and not yet. We are quickly approaching the time of Advent, a time when days grow shorter and the darkness seeps in earlier and earlier. And so we too must ask ourselves, how will we wait? The message that the Hebrew people declare unflinchingly, unreservedly, unembarrassedly is that there is not a time of empty waiting, but only a time full of God's power and will to transform what seems hopeless into an unimaginable future and life. What Hannah knew was that it is precisely during this time of waiting that we can draw close to God, just as God draws close to us. We should find this message to us enormously comforting, just as it was for Hannah. She gave birth to a son whom she named Samuel, which means because I asked the Lord for him. Samuel was dedicated to the Lord before he was born, and he will become the last judge, the man who God will continue to work through in bringing a new beginning for Israel. Today, we acknowledge the unfinished nature of what God has already set in motion through Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. As the author of Hebrews wrote, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. Amen. For those who know the grief in 
in change of bereavement. And we pray for all those who work to bring healing and comfort, and agencies which offer support and care for those who suffer. We pray for all who feel helpless or hopeless in this present time, for those struggling to make ends meet or trying to find employment, for those caught up in the pain of misunderstanding or broken relationships, for those working through situations of conflict at home or at work. We pray for all who offer guidance and support in the midst of such difficulties and for those who have skills in reconciliation and mediation. God of our past and our future, God of healing and hope, help our congregation and churches everywhere as we regroup after months of pandemic isolation to engage each day with faithfulness and creativity. Where we need correction, show us a new way. Where we need love and encouragement, draw near. Wherever our, whatever our challenge, stay with us on our way. We pray now for people and loved ones who are personal to us. As we prepare to leave this service, walk with us and show us how to live each day as those who follow Jesus. For we dare to pray the words he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now Jackie will play our closing blessing. The Lord bless you. Thank you. 